For the first time in decades, the French military is preparing for the unthinkable, high-intensity warfare against the near peer. French President Emmanuel Macron has called on Ukraine's allies to not be, quote, cowards in providing support for the war against Russia. We will do everything necessary so that Russia cannot win this war. Chocolate bleu. The rematch none of us saw coming. Unless you had read France's 2022 National Strategic Review. It's written by their top generals, policymakers, and their intelligence agencies. It outlines how the country plans to address emerging threats. According to it, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, about 1,800 kilometers away from their own borders, has not only challenged the world order, but forced France into a wartime economy. To put into perspective just how close that is to them, if you live in New York, it would be like if there was 400,000 Russian soldiers in Miami. French Army Chief of Staff Pierre Schill called it, quote, a transformation and the most important modernization undergone since World War II. France's armed forces are one of the most powerful and combat tested in all of Europe. But there's one problem. Two and a half decades ago, when they had their last major transformation, it shrank their military size and budget. This graph here shows how French defense spending as a percentage of their GDP from 1960 to today has gone down from 5.4% in 1960 to 1 1.8% in 2019. A similar trend happened throughout most Western countries during this time. This made perfect sense. The Soviet Union had just collapsed, and it seemed like the world had never been safer. To kickstart their defense industry back into high gear, France's President Emmanuel Macron recently unveiled a six-year defense budget, which will now total $450 billion, representing nearly a 40% increase. France is sixth in the world for defense spending by purchase power parity, and it's climbing. But you might be surprised to learn the new plan doesn't call for any major increase in force size. Strangely, it doesn't ask for a massive boost in production of new tanks. This has caused a major debate, both inside the French defense establishment and to outside observers, about whether the additional funds are being spent effectively. So what new capabilities and weapon systems will French General Pierre Schill actually invest in? And how is French President Macron attempting to position himself as one of the top leaders of European security. But before we get into that, I wanna tell you about this video's sponsor, AFMA, the American Armed Forces Mutual Aid Association. Established in 1879, they're the longest standing nonprofit financial solutions provider supporting military families and veterans. Their membership numbers exceed 85,000. They offer a wide range of support to the military community through insurance and financial planning services that help to set you up for success after leaving the military. These services include VA home loan mortgages, wealth management, and life insurance. And since American Armed Forces Mutual Aid Association has been around for so long, they know the specific challenges and needs that veterans like us face when leaving the military. It's important to be prepared and start planning for the future. Whether it's a supplement to SGLI or low rate loans to help you through the tough times, AFMA is there to help shore up your family's future. So head over to AFMA.com, that's A-A-F-M-A-A.com to learn more about how their community of members share these important benefits for life. To win without risk is a triumph without glory. The creme de la creme of French strategic thought came about during the Cold War, and we'll see it's underpinned their defense thinking ever since then. Following the Nazi occupation, France aggressively pursued a defense posture that reflected its desire to not have its sovereignty or autonomy stripped from it ever again. Veteran of the First World War and French President Charles de Gaulle sought to establish their own nuclear deterrent. He led France to being the fourth country to test an independently developed nuclear weapon in 1960. Today, France is uniquely the only country in the European Union to wield nuclear weapons. This is likely why even the Soviet Union's contingency plan to invade Western Europe during the Cold War saw them planning to stop before France at the Rhine River. In fact, at the height of the Cold War, France had 594 nuclear warheads. Today, that number has been halved at about 290, which can be fired from submarines or aircraft. And what is the readiness of that submarine and air force? Take a look at El Long, the peninsula located in Brittany, region of France. This is where France's ballistic missile submarines operate from. 
It's estimated that in 2022, they invested $5.6 billion into building and maintaining their nuclear capabilities. It's a lot of money. It suggests that it probably does work and it's credible, but that number will now jump to 7 billion. This is where four French ballistic submarines operate from. According to the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, they have three sets of 16 M51 submarine-based missiles that have a range of six to 9,000 kilometers. The French Navy maintains a continuous at-sea deterrent posture with at least one boat on patrol, one preparing for patrol, and one returning to port, and one in maintenance. Each submarine patrol lasts an average of approximately 70 days. These subs have one mission, to stay undetectable and ready to fire a nuclear strike at the president's orders. But when we hear their mission tempo, something jumps out to me right away. That doesn't leave much room for redundancy if anything goes wrong or if any single sub is destroyed. France isn't publicly talking about any of their vulnerabilities, of course, but I think if you read in between the lines of where the money is going, it reveals something. I'm not certain, but it's possible that over the last 25 years of defense cuts, it's left their nuclear weapons deterrent weakened vis-a-vis -a, -vis a large amount of the budget that needs to go towards fixing it. Did I use that term correctly? According to the former French colonel and historian Michael Goya, who's known as one of the top French military analysts, over the past 25 years, the nuclear submarine strike force has shrunk from 12 submarines to four. This is part of the reason why I think France is investing billions of dollars into next generation ballistic subs instead of masses of tanks and new infantry regiments. In fact, 60% of that additional money from the $450 billion defense plan will go straight to modernizing France's nuclear deterrent. When you factor in the fact that about 30 billion is lost to inflation right off the bat, and even more is lost to the increased cost of materials, we can start to see why building both a nuclear deterrent and building a massive force might not be in the cards for France. When we look closely at where France is choosing to spend their defense funds, we need to consider the fact that they're a part of the NATO Security Alliance. This means they're able to concentrate on what unique capabilities they can offer. They can focus on where their strengths are, while allowing their allies to cover down on any blind spots or weaknesses. There's no other country in the EU currently who can offer a nuclear deterrent. This move is also reflected in their publicly stated strategic objectives saying, quote, the conflict in Ukraine reveals the essential role our nuclear forces play in the security of the Euro-Atlantic area. It demonstrates the need to maintain a robust and credible nuclear deterrent to prevent a major war. Another huge chunk of the money is going towards developing a new capability for their air to ground missiles to carry a 300 kiloton thermonuclear warhead that can strike beyond 500 kilometers and acquiring 32 new fighter jets by 2032, which can launch from their 27 different air bases strategically located throughout their land. France is likely preparing for war, partly because from Macron's point of view, he feels betrayed by Putin to some degree on a personal level. Because you might not know this, but only a few weeks before the invasion of Ukraine, Macron met with Putin for negotiations to try to end tensions. Macron continued after the invasion to de-escalate, saying, quote, we must not humiliate Russia so that the day when the fighting stops, we can build an exit ramp through diplomatic means. Considering how France's intelligence agencies were unable to predict Putin's intentions, Macron may have felt slighted. From Macron's point of view, he likely felt that he tried every peaceful diplomatic approach and option that he could with Putin, and from his point of view, it got him nowhere. There are essentially five key areas that I think France has a unique ability to contribute to in terms of European security. One, their Navy. Two, their Air Force. Three, space. Four, cybering. Five, nuclear weapons. A recent study by the French think tank, French Institute for International Relations, states that between 1991 and 2021, their battleships dropped from 1,349 to 222, and their frigates went from 686 down to 254. Former French soldier and historian Goya stated that the French Navy has shrunk by 40% of its workforce in the past few decades. This is why another major part of the budget will be eaten up by the development of a next generation nuclear powered aircraft carrier called the Pang, which weighs almost twice as much as their first one and will be out to sea by 2038. They also are gonna receive 15 new frigates by 2030, all of which isn't cheap, but who else in the EU can contribute those kind of assets? Agree or disagree, the one place that the French defense thinkers, from their perspective, do not see a value add is raw manpower. 
and many have indeed disagreed. Critics have stated that France should invest more in massive amounts of armored infantry fighting vehicles and tanks instead. After all, we've seen the evidence of how much attrition could potentially eat away at equipment quickly. And a quick look at France reveals they have one of the largest populations and GDPs in all of Europe, with 67.5 million people and $2.9 trillion a year. They've historically been very geopolitically important in this region, partially due to their massive coastline along the Atlantic Ocean, the English Channel, and the Mediterranean Sea. These waterways help to facilitate trade and transportation with their neighbors. They have useful natural defensive geography with the Rhine River and the towering Alps in the south. They're at the crossroads between Northern and Southern Europe, as well as between Eastern and Western Europe. This is why, historically speaking, France has always played a major role in European security, but we'll see they want to play an even bigger part. Due in part to these factors, it'd be possible for them to raise a large standing army with massive stockpiles of tanks if they wanted to return to a Cold War era way of life. I don't claim to know what the right answer is, but we can look at some of the evidence for what their line of thinking is. And I think it comes down to one single word for the French, sovereignty. When perusing through the pages of their national defense strategy, one running theme instantly jumps out to you. The word sovereignty is used 25 times in the 60 page document, and the word autonomy appears 27 times. Not surprisingly, the concept is top of mind for Europe right now. For comparison, the US national defense strategy paper has the word sovereignty appear just once, and it's in reference to respecting other nations' sovereignty. The term sovereignty itself is of French origin. It comes from the old French word souveraineté. Famous French philosophers Jean Baudin and Jean-Jacques Rousseau are often credited with laying the foundation for our modern understanding of the term, defining it to mean the supreme power to make and enforce laws within a defined territory. It appears like France believes the best way to maintain sovereignty is with a credible nuclear deterrent and strong defenses against cyber and space warfare. That's where a large amount of the funds are going. A large amount of money is also going towards increasing their intelligence capabilities because as we saw, they had to fire the head of their intelligence agency when he failed to predict that Russia's intention was to invade Ukraine. People will of course agree or disagree with this plan. Charles de Gaulle once said, patriotism is when love of your own people comes first, nationalism when hate for people other than your own comes first. De Gaulle was a strong supporter of his nation's ability to govern itself without unwanted influence from external states. During his presidency, Charles de Gaulle made efforts to grant independence to former French colonies in Africa. He supported autonomy in Africa with the decolonization movements throughout the 1960s, to, to an extent. However, that doesn't mean he didn't keep strong French economic and military influences in the region. The nations that gained independence during this period include Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, you can feel it in their DNA when you try to ask them for directions to Paris in English and you're met with French instead. The message is clear. You're not going to make them behave in a certain way. There are tired jokes about France surrendering in World War I and World War II, which I think misses the point of how powerful France was throughout much of recorded history, before and after that. However, those dark times in World War II in France's history do help explain why they're so focused on autonomy. And I don't mean that they're necessarily worried about being invaded by Russian ground forces or occupied by Chinese soldiers. We don't even have to get as alarmist as all that to understand the French point of view. What I mean is they have made a pattern of strategic decisions clearly meant to prevent themselves from becoming too dependent on any great power, friend or foe. For example, France is less dependent on Russia for energy requirements than some of its neighbors. They currently only need about 17% of their energy imported from Russia. This is because France makes extensive use of their nuclear reactors to generate power. It's not just Russia and China they avoid becoming reliant on. France has taken care to avoid dependencies even on their close allies, which personally I think a lot of that comes from not wanting to ever have be in that position again where they need to ask for help in a world war again. To that point, some experts claim that some European countries are overly reliant on the United States for some of their defense industry production which can limit their autonomy to some degree. These factors help to explain why this new French defense bill is about them investing in building up their own military industry. France plans to do much of their military spending in-house with their own military industrial complex. That's why French President Macron said, quote, 
We are entering a war economy that I believe we will be in for a long time. Spending a lot to buy abroad is not a good idea. We should spend a lot, but we should think in the veins of European strategic autonomy. We need to reinforce a European technology and defense industrial base. So he aims for that increased spending to be invested back into France by using French defense giants like Nextar and Thales. We can tie this directly into their strategic objective number three, an economy contributing to a defense mindset. But really, entering a wartime economy is difficult because some experts are saying it's forcing France to choose between social and defense programs. You got your bread and your butter. A few days after announcing the increase in defense spending, France also announced they would raise their retirement age from 62 to 64, causing citizens to protest in the streets. Some believe this cut to the national pension system is the main way the government plans to keep fiscal discipline with the defense spending rising. In the United States, we have a meme that speaks to this idea. We say our enemies are about to find out why none of us have health care. Nations across all of Europe face a similar problem, having to make difficult decisions between defense spending and social programs which have long been a staple of European life. The French publication Le Monde reported that Macron said, quote, there is no luxury, ease, or comfort in this project. There is only what is necessary. At a time when every euro of the French taxpayer must be saved, we had to find the best compromise between a defense that matches our ambitions and the essential principles of sobriety. Prevention is better than cure. One of the famous French strategic decisions that I think is best understood through this lens of sovereignty is when Charles de Gaulle pulled France out of NATO in 1966. That meant no French soldiers would be under NATO command, which he felt was controlled too much by America. De Gaulle said, quote, France will not be led by an alliance over which it does not have control. Why would France or anyone want to leave NATO, hypothetically? Well, partly because of one of the disadvantages of a security alliance is that you're bound to the framework of that regulation. Leaving arguably allowed France to assert strategic autonomy over its own nuclear arsenal. Now, all the diplomatic buzzwords aside, what that means is that France is independently able to make their own decisions. Except that's not entirely accurate. Yes, France did withdraw from the integrated military command structure of NATO, but they still remained a member of the alliance. Paris always made it explicit that they would uphold Article 5 and come to help any allied nation in the event of war breaking out and they expected the same of its NATO allies. Throughout the Cold War period, the other major pillar of de Gaulle's defensive strategy was conscription, or draft. France maintained a massive standing army of 500,000 soldiers thanks to their national conscription system. Conscription is a French word for, no, I'm just playing, that's, that's a Latin word. But France was the first modern nation state to introduce universal military conscription as a condition of citizenship. The levée en masse was a previously unimagined policy of mass conscription. France maintained it in one form or another all the way from Napoleon Bonaparte until 1995 when French President Jacques Chirac was elected. At this moment, the Iron Curtain that had divided Europe for decades had already been torn down. During this time period between the 1980s and 1990s, French society underwent a massive transformation that saw the privatization of banking and telecommunications. France joined the European Union, which was established in 1992, and suddenly the risk of war with any of their European buddies seemed more and more like some kind of distant dream. In response to this changing security situation, French president announced sweeping military reforms that saw their armed forces shrink by about a third, down from 500,000 to 180,000 active duty, and then they became an all-volunteer force by 2001. Jacques Chirac also removed one leg of France's strategic nuclear triad, so they no longer have any surface-to-surface -surface launched nuclear missile capabilities. I understand that in hindsight, it might appear like hallowing out of many of the world's militaries during this time was short-sighted, but personally, I think it's a good thing that many countries around the world were able to shrink their forces. It shows that the military industrial complex isn't able to get whatever they want, whenever they want it. The will and consent of the governed people is necessary to maintain a massive standing military in a society. This is an important characteristic for a free society. And France continued to exercise their autonomy. They famously refused to participate in America's invasion of Iraq 
which they thought was an unnecessary and illegal war. Recently, French President Macron stated that Europe must not be a follower of the US on Taiwan, saying the worst thing would be to think that we Europeans must be followers and adapt ourselves to the American rhythm and Chinese overreaction. These statements do interestingly run counter to a lot of statements in their official 2022 defense strategy paper though that frequently lists China as a major adversary and reason for this increased defense spending. But that brings up an important question. From France's point of view, what do they believe is their adversary's point of view? Why are their adversaries mad at them? According to the French Strategic Review, the position of liberal democracies has been weakened because they're defending an international order whose foundations, international law, multilateralism, Western values are being openly challenged by several states. This dynamic is sustained by resentment towards political legacies, sometimes colonial in nature, and perceptions of unfair development, which dovetail with the growth in authoritarianism and illiberal regimes around the world. The way I personally interpret what the French government is saying there is that they believe that Russia, Iran, and China see the current world order as unfair, that it favors the West, and due to that, there's been a rise of authoritarian governments in response. So if I'm interpreting this correctly, China, Russia, and Iran are trying to change the world order to be more in their favor. Revenge is a dish best served cold. Sometimes it might take 10 years to transform your armed forces, but if you plan correctly, your nation's security will be guaranteed. And if you plan incorrectly, you might end up with the uh, Maginot Line. Take a look at the 2008 white paper on defense and national security in France. They only write these puppies up like once every 25 years or so. The 332 page document was created by a commission of professionals from the armed forces, various political parties, and even philosophers to create a new French defense doctrine. Very postmodern of them to have philosophers helping with their military planning. The major takeaway from the document is that the French military's traditional focus from territorial defense forces within their own land was redirected to meet new global challenges in a threat environment that was otherwise known as terrorism. And that's what former President Sarkozy did. He transformed their military into an expeditionary force. And in 2009, they fully rejoined the NATO organization. Francophone Africa would be the primary task of the French military. The rising terrorism in the Sahel region in former colonies saw those countries requesting help from France's expeditionary forces. A key concept we need to keep in mind here is that the French military is attempting to make a major transition from what's called that expeditionary force to a high intensity force. According to Army Doctrine Reference Publication 3-0, Unified Land Operations, expeditionary capability is the ability to promptly deploy combined arms forces worldwide into any area of operations and conduct operations upon arrival. This type of mission is exactly what France has built their military to excel at for the past three decades. It allowed them to deploy three to 5,000 troops inside the Sahel region in Africa within just a month. Their combat successes on these missions even influenced thinking in the US military. A series of terror attacks inside France in 2015 and 2016 only served as evidence to reinforce that they were investing in the right capabilities and that high intensity warfare was not on the menu. It meant that they prioritized highly mobile light armor that could be transported by allied C-130s and C-160 cargo planes. But the downside to an expeditionary force is that it lacks sheer numbers, it lacks heavy assets, like massive amounts of main battle tanks. To put into context how big this plan change would be, under the new plan, France would aim to be able to deploy and sustain three times the past amount at 25,000 troops within 30 days, representing roughly one fourth of their ground troop strength. According to War on the Rocks article, a really great article written by Michael Shuriken, the French deployment to Mali in 2013 had only four Caesar mobile artillery vehicles deployed out of roughly 46 operational ones. For contrast, in a high intensity war, Russia has deployed over 4,000 artillery pieces in Ukraine. Understandably, one of the main points of the article that it was trying to make is that there is a major concern of the lack of sheer quantity. Because in expeditionary forces, there's way less emphasis on artillery or ammunition stockpiles for that type of counterinsurgency warfare. France's chief of staff, the armed forces General Bruckhardt, appeared to agree with this concern. 
He said the following during a parliamentary hearing in July 2022, our capacity to be an expeditionary force does not instantly make us sustainable for conducting a high intensity war. It's like the equivalent of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley in the US, one of the top military advisors and planners. So you'd think that they'd be investing in mass and quantity of vehicles and soldiers, but, but they aren't. Let's look at some of the numbers to see why analysts are concerned. The most up-to-date numbers indicate France has about 76 Javelin missile launchers, and as of 2017, they had about 260 missiles to go in those launchers. France has a total of 6,634 armored vehicles, but that only includes 200 of their main battle tank, the Leclerc. The lack of main battle tanks is one of the main points of disagreement about French forces organization. For contrast, the United States and Russia has stockpiles of over 3,000 tanks. Whether you believe France needs more tanks or not will likely be determined on whether or not you think they can rely on their allies to cover down on their needs. For example, Poland's on track to have more than 1,200 tanks. On the other hand, if autonomy and independence is paramount to your thinking, then you would likely want to be able to act without needing to ask for tanks from any allies. On the other, other hand, nuclear weapons can theoretically act as your own best friend. France operates 629 of the VBCI infantry fighting vehicles. Their IFVs are all light wheeled instead of tracked, so overall they're trading protection for mobility, and you can see that reflected in their aggressive fighting doctrine. That isn't to say that their army isn't getting anything from the budget, but it will be pared down. They will acquire 200 of the Jaguar armored recon vehicles instead of the original 300 order. They're getting 1,300 Griffin armored personnel carriers, down from the 1,800 that they originally ordered. Only 160 of their main battle tanks will be modernized instead of the 200 total originally scheduled. They have a total of 1,076 anti-tank guided missile launchers. According to Macron, another winner in their defense budget will be their air defense capabilities which he claims will get a 50% boost. When it comes to air defense, this French military website lists their capabilities. Notably, they have 10 batteries of what is likely several hundred launchers of the SAMPT air defense system. It's a theater level asset that can counter ballistic missiles and aircraft at 600 kilometers range. They also list two satellite-based early warning sensors and multiple air defense systems on frigates in addition to 12 ground-based short range systems. In an interview with foreign policy magazine Vincent Desportes, a retired French general and current professor said, quote, The war in Ukraine has shown once and for all that wars are won on the ground. Technology is important, but at the end of the day, it's about men fighting other men. The French defense bill is totally insufficient to build up a high volume army, not making a substantial effort to increase our stocks of conventional weapons means taking a big risk. According to some experts, these stockpiles that I just outlined for you are not nearly enough mass. The reason the new French strategy is controversial is because about 6 billion is also going towards space defense and 4 billion towards cybering security. These are two other areas inside the EU that France is uniquely positioned to be able to contribute to in ways that some other countries aren't because of how technically skilled their economy is. The French government services have been hit with intense cyber attacks recently. This falls under strategic objective four, where they say, quote, adopting response strategies that galvanize all the options the state has available, both European and international, means cyber attacks can be made particularly costly for attackers. So what I think they're saying there is that all that four billion isn't just going to cyber defense, it's also going to something called cyber retaliation or cyber attack. You hear about cyber defense all the time in the West, but no one mentions their cyber attack ability that we know they have. Defense is often just another word for offense in these kind of papers. They use a lot of euphemisms. Little by little, the bird builds the nest. The chief of staff of the French army, General Pierre Schill, reported that the army wouldn't increase in size, but that their reserves would double from 40,000 to 80,000. Instead of investing in pumping out more tanks, they're gonna double production of their Caesar howitzers to eight per month and invest in quality over quantity. General Pierre Schill's strategy will be to reorganize the French army away from small units attaching to each other in kind of like a Lego block modular way to instead be this larger cohesive groups that deploy together. So how is that artillery capability doing? From a French parliamentary report, quote, the overall deterioration of French munitions stocks since the end of the Cold War 
seems to have become untenable both in view of the current strategic context and France's military ambitions. At the start of Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2022, France could only produce 1,000 shells per month. They've been able to triple that to 3,000 today, but there's a strange reason why they can't reach their goal of 5,000. It's because France is running into a gunpowder supply shortage. Your typical artillery shell is made up of three separate parts. You got your steel casing, high explosive charge, and a detonator. Usually your propellant charge will be separate because gunners want to use between one and over seven, depending on the range that they're aiming for. According to the news agency France 24, nitrocellulose, also known as gun cotton, is a key ingredient in gunpowder manufacture. And guess where most of that supply comes from? China who oddly enough just so happened to run out and stop selling it to France right after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. How convenient. France is one of the most powerful militaries in the world and their defense industry, although it was cut after the Cold War, remains one of the strongest today. In fact, according to SIPRI trends in international arms transfers, some of France's weapons production has now risen and they're now the number two arms exporter in the entire world, outranking even Russia as of this year. There are several reasons for this. One is because Russia is producing more for themselves instead of outside nations. Another is that outside foreign nations don't want Russian equipment as much anymore. So what this means is France is filling in some of that gap. They've exported over 500 armored vehicles, 200 aircraft, and 120 artillery pieces, generating much needed revenue for their nation. All of this helps them with defense production. One of their main ways of producing at scale is thanks to foreign export contracts. Without Diving too deep into it, it generates about $28.8 billion in revenue per year, about half of their yearly entire defense budget. So let me know what you think of France's defense spending plan. Do you think that they need more mass, or can they rely on their allies to contribute that while they carry the big nuclear stick? I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe if you have an extra minute. Check out one of these videos. Here, you might enjoy them because they're similar.